Why do I have to go to this stupid court thing today? Why can't you just get back together? Why can't you guys leave me out of this? You know I'm missing art class today because of this. Can you be with me when the judge talks to me? What if I start crying? Are you getting divorced because of me? I'm afraid to go in alone. I want things back the way they used to be. Does the judge know Judge Judy? Can my dog come with me if the judge doesn't let me live with you? The Family Law Section of the Pennsylvania Bar Association is proud to present the judicial interview of the child. As our section prepared this project, we were mindful that there are very few educational tools, if any, available to guide all the participants on how the judicial interview of children in child custody cases should be conducted. In fact, judges new to family court, many of whom have had no prior professional experience with the in-camera interview, have often noted the absence of available resources. This video contains interviews with seasoned family court judges from across the Commonwealth who will discuss the format of their time-tested child interviewing techniques from their very many years on the bench. We'll also show some model interviews using child actors to demonstrate effective interviewing techniques. Every judge currently serving in Pennsylvania has had an opportunity to participate in this project through a written survey, which is contained in the written materials that accompany this video. The custody statute sets forth 15 factors the court should consider when awarding custody, including the well-reasoned preference of the child based on the child's maturity and judgment. In addition to expressing her preference, a child may also present relevant evidence on several other factors, including which party will more likely encourage frequent contact with the other party the parental duties performed by each parent, the child's sibling relationships, and which party will more likely attend to the child's daily physical, emotional, educational, developmental, and special needs. Because the child may provide information that is not only helpful but crucial to the court's determination of the child's best interest, failure of the trial court to interview the child may be considered reversible error, especially if the child is old enough to testify as to his preference. At the time of the hearing on a party's complaint for custody, petition to modify custody, or petition for protection from abuse, the court may be asked by a party to interview the child or may decide to conduct the interview. Before she is permitted to testify, the child must be qualified to testify as a witness in the case. Whether or not a child is competent to testify depends on her intelligence and understanding of her obligation to tell the truth. In determining competency, the court should consider the child's ability to communicate, to understand questions, provide appropriate responses, to observe and recall an event, to differentiate between reality and make-believe, and to understand the consequences of telling a lie. It is within the court's discretion to determine whether a child is competent to testify in a custody case or a PFA case, but most judges will err on the side of caution and interview children who may provide helpful information giving appropriate weight to the testimony based on the circumstances. Our Superior Court has held that little weight should be given to children's testimony at ages six or seven, and that age 10 is probably the youngest age at which a child's preference would hold great weight. However, the older the child does not necessarily mean the more weighty the testimony. The judge must also consider other factors such as the child's level of maturity, honesty, and intelligence. For example, the Superior Court has held that a 12-year-old state of preference should have been given more weight because of the child's intelligence and reasoning, but has also found that a 16-year-old's state of preference should have been discounted because of the lack of explanation provided to support that preference. A judge may disregard the child's statement when they perceive it is motivated by a fear of a parent's reaction. 
Thus, the court must determine whether there has been psychological manipulation of the child by a parent or a third party. The court should question the child to be satisfied that the child's preference is made of his volition and not on account of overt or subtle persuasion by a parent or siblings. Factors which the court might consider to discount a child's testimony would include a parent's bribery or leniency toward a child prior to a court hearing. Pennsylvania Rule of Civil Procedure 1915-11b sets forth the procedure for a child interview. It states that the court may interview the child in open court or in chambers, also known as the in-camera interview. The rule states that the interview must be conducted in the presence of the attorneys and may be in the presence of the parties in the court's discretion. The attorneys have the right to interview the child under the supervision of the court. The court may require the attorneys to submit the questions to the court and the court will direct the questions to the child. The interview must be a part of the court record to ensure proper appellate review. The most important consideration for the court in attempting to ascertain the true feelings of a child is to create an atmosphere in which the child will feel free to express herself. The Superior Court has noted that such a setting is much less likely to exist when the party's attorneys are present. For this reason, in a custody matter, the Superior Court has allowed the parties to waive the presence of their attorneys during the interview, provided that the record otherwise supports the court's decision. Also, in a custody matter where the parties agree, the record may be impounded, thus protecting the child's desire for non-disclosure while ensuring that the record is preserved for appellate review. However, in an abuse matter, different rules apply. Because a PFA order has potential criminal ramifications, the court must afford the defendant the right to present witnesses, testify on his or her behalf, and cross-examine the opposing party and witnesses. At least one panel of the Superior Court has held that this right extends to cross-examining child witnesses, which could prevent an interview outside of the presence of the attorneys or conducted solely by the judge. Also, the rules for conducting interviews before masters and conciliators in conferences may be different. Because these conferences are not record hearings, the same requirements of the attorney's right to be present and making a record of the interview do not apply. The explanatory comments to Rule 1915-11 provide guidance as to when a child should be brought in for an interview. A party may bring a child to a conference or hearing, but in the absence of an order of court, is not required to do so. The explanatory comments to the rule state that the presence of a child is not always necessary or desirable. The experience may be traumatic and disruptive. The rule expressly states that the child should not be required to attend a hearing or conference in every case. If the judge or conciliator does not require the presence of the child, you should discuss with your client in detail whether the potential benefits of calling the child as a witness outweigh the potential disadvantages, including causing the child undue stress and anxiety. Certain psychological considerations may be helpful when conducting the judicial interview. Psychologists suggest the following. The judge should be as non-threatening as possible sitting rather than standing to help the child relax. The judge should try to develop an alliance with the child by discussing the child's friends, interests, sports, social activities, heroes, etc. before delving into more serious topics. The judge should not rush the discussion as it may take time for the child to process questions and formulate responses in this emotionally charged situation. The judge should allow the child to ask questions, which is a sign that the child is beginning to trust and bond with you. The judge should observe the child's body language. Is the child making eye contact or looking away? The child squirming in the chair may be a sign of discomfort with the questioning. Do not assume that the child is telling the truth. Children will tell you what you want to hear in order to eliminate fear and retaliation, especially at an early age. Children ages 10 and 11 begin to make progress with moral judgments. As a judge, your role is to help the child become more familiar with you and to trust you, 
With support from the interviewer, the child may find it more difficult to maintain distortions of reality and will begin to rely on their trust in you to make more appropriate, truthful statements. Now, let's watch some mock interviews to see various interviewing techniques in action. Charlotte, good morning. I'm Judge Braxton. How are you? Good. How are you? I am your judge, and I wanted to take some time and talk with you today. I hope you feel comfortable here in my room. Do you need a glass of water or anything? No, I'm okay. I need you to answer me with words because that stenographer over there is taking down what you and I both say, and I have to make sure I know exactly what you want me to know. Is that okay with you? Yep. Good. What have you seen? Well, my mom was with her boyfriend, and then my dad found out, and it was ugly. Oh, well, how did you feel? I felt sad because before you were like a family, and then we just weren't anymore. Well, but you still have your mother, and you still have your father, so you are a family, aren't you? Mm-hmm. And do you think anybody stopped loving you? I don't think so, but maybe my sister just a tiny bit. But one of the things I'm concerned about is the way you feel. And I think you're telling me that you feel that you still love both your mother and you love both your father. How do you feel about your school? I like it. It's really cool. What about the teachers? Do they make your life fun or do they make it difficult? Well, the homework is not fun, but the school is really, they make, yeah, they're fun. One of the things I'm looking at is where you may want to be living. Did you and your sister ever talk about that? Yeah, she talks about it sometimes, but I don't really talk about it that much. Well, what does she say? I don't know. Well, she does all the talking. Is that what it is? Mm-hmm. And when she talks, she talks about what she would like to do, doesn't she? Yeah. Well, what do you think she would like to do? I think she wants to be with my dad. Right. Now, you're spending weekends with both, so you get an opportunity to be with both your mother and your father on some of the weekends. Is that correct? Yes. And do you enjoy that? Mm-hmm. What do you enjoy most? Um, I like that I can spend an equal amount of time with both of them without, like, having to worry about where I'm going next. I just spend the time there then. When you say you spend the time there, do they do things with you, or do you just sit around and play games on your computer? They do stuff with us. Do they? Mm hmm Well, what kind of things do you do with your dad? Well, sometimes we play catch, or we go outside and play. Sometimes we go, like, swimming in the summer. And what other things do you do besides just the athletics or the playing of games? Um, well, sometimes he helps us make stuff, like my sister likes to do, like, little crafts and stuff. Do you like that? Yeah. Sometimes I play with those things with young people, too. It's fun when you put things together, right? Mm-hmm. Do you enjoy putting them together with your mother as well? Mm-hmm. Well, I do track and Girl Scouts. Oh. Uh -huh. You're in the Brownies? Mm-hmm. And how long have you been a Brownie? A few years. I want to talk with you about where you're going to be living next year, and I needed to know whether you had any ideas as to where you might prefer to live. Not really. Okay. And you like living with both your mother and your father as it is right now, and you enjoy being with your sister? Mm-hmm. Well, you wouldn't want to be someplace without your sister, though, would you? I want to stay with my sister. Right. And uh, does she want to stay with you? Does she tell you that? Sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes she says other things, doesn't she? Yeah. Now, everything you talked to me about today, were you telling me the truth, or were you telling me something other than the truth? I was telling you the truth. Do you know what it means to tell the truth? Yes. What does it mean? It means that I'm telling what's actually happening, and I'm not telling some fake story that's made up. Good. It's important to tell the truth, though, as you've done today. Don't you think so? Mm-hmm. And everything you told me was what you honestly believe? Yes. And that's very important. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, Samantha. I'm Hi. Judge Eaton. How are Hi. you today? I'm doing fine, you know. Mm, yeah. Did you have to miss school today? Yeah. Well, that's a good thing, right? 
I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been hearing a lot about you uh, in the trial so yeah. far, um, and I hear a couple things. Like I hear you're a, a soccer player. Yep. Are you uh, eat offense, defense, goalie? What do you do? Defense. Defense. Not really good at the whole scoring thing. Yeah. 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 It's more of just a hobby and less of a skill. Um, that's my daughter. Um, she's about your age, and she plays soccer. So I'm uh, I'm a soccer mom. I sit at the soccer games all the time. Oh. So, well, let's talk about why you're here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about some uh, ground rules first. Okay? okay. All right. First of all. Um, the only people in this room here are is my friend the tip staff here, okay? She works with me, all right? But first of all, what, one thing I do want you to know that what we say in here isn't secret, okay? This isn't like double secret probation between me and you, all right? Okay. The court reporter's over there is taken down, and if your mom or dad could see in a book if they want to see it. So whatever you say, they can find out if they want to find out, okay. all right? So we'll try to do the best we can under those circumstances. Um, but, um, so if you tell me I can't tell something, I won't tell it, but they can find it out. Do you understand that? I understand. So, why don't we just start off, is there anything you want to tell me? Um, I really don't want to move to Washington, D.C. with my mom. It's a really bad situation, and she, the, Barry, the guy she is with, has kids, and I don't know them, and I don't want to live there, I don't want to leave my friends and school, and it's just it's so frustrating. And dad isn't home a lot, and it's, it's such a bad situation. Okay, so let's talk about that one step at a time. You ever, have you ever been down to Barry's house? Uh, a few times. It's, it's really awkward. Okay. Uncomfortable. Well, what do you mean by that? What do you mean awkward and uncomfortable? Um, well, he has two kids. He has a littler girl, kind of like my little sister. Uh, they don't really get along really well. And he has a son my age, but he doesn't talk. He just kind of... Did it make you mad when your mom did that? So mad. Yeah. <laughs> so mad. I was... Screaming, it was bad. Okay, so is it fair to say you kind of think this whole thing is your mom's fault? Yeah. Okay. It really is. The fact that she would, that first of all, she distanced herself so much from the family because of work and stuff, and then she'd go and do something so terrible like this. So you're the it's babysitter at home? Pretty much. Well, do you think maybe if you moved to, to um, uh, Washington that that might not happen so much, or what do you think would happen then? Well, I'd rather look after my sister and be responsible than be in a really uncomfortable situation leaving my friends and stuff. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, school and soccer I wouldn't be able to do, and I wouldn't be able to do the drama club, and I wouldn't be able to see all my friends. Mm -hmm. So it's just so far and, away. Well, you know, one of the questions I usually ask kids is if they had, you know, a wish, and almost everybody says, I wish my mom and dad would stay together. Do you, do you well, feel that way? I just wish there could be a way for both of them to be happy and for everyone in the family to be happy. Well, let's talk about that. You said your mom was a soccer mom and your dad comes when you when you have your adventure in theater too, right? Yeah. Okay, so do they come and watch when you do that? Do they Usually. Do soccer games? Usually. Not every single one, just because I'm older and it really doesn't matter that much, but... Mm -hmm. to, to the ones that are important, and they usually can tell which one matters and which one doesn't. Well, let me ask, the, let me ask you this question. If your mom were staying here, and your dad were moving to D.C., would that change what you wanted to do? Probably. Okay. But you'd still have all that new going down to D.C., so how would that be different? But at least I wouldn't be with a person who I felt betrayed by. If I say that you're going to stay with your dad, what would you like to, how, much, how often would you like to see your mom? Um, maybe weekends or it's par partial summers or winter break. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Smaller amounts of time than with my dad, just because I don't know how long I can handle it without just flat out being rude mm -hmm. to Barry and the kids, which, you know, I don't like them, but I wouldn't want to, well, yeah, I don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, is there anything else you want to tell me, Samantha? Um, I think I'm good. Okay, well, I'll do the best I can to make a decision, all right? I have to take what everybody told me and put together, and I'm going to try to do what's best for you, okay? okay. All right, very nice to meet you. Thank you, you too. Okay. And now, let's hear from some experienced family law judges from around the Commonwealth about their best practices in conducting a child interview based on their years of experience on the bench. My name is Kim Eaton. I'm a judge in Allegheny County of Pennsylvania. I'm the former supervising judge of the Family Division of Allegheny County, and I've been on the bench 15 years. All of those 15 years I've been in the Family Division. My name's Thomas Durr. I'm the President Judge of Butler County. 
I've been on the uh, Common Pleas bench since 1992. I've been hearing domestic cases for that full period of time, a little over 22 years. I'm Catherine Platt. I am the Family Court Administrative Judge in Chester County, Pennsylvania. I've been on the bench for 16 years and have been assigned in family for all of that time, although not exclusively. Hi, I'm Tom Kistler. I'm the President Judge of Center County, Pennsylvania. And I've been a judge for 16 years in a general jurisdiction practice. We do everything from homicides and medical malpractice to family court. My name is Barry Dozier. I'm a trial judge in Delaware County Court of Common Pleas. I'm one of 20 judges in Delaware County, and I presently serve as a liaison judge in the family and the juvenile division. I've been a judge for approximately 13 years, and uh, almost eight of those years has been in the family division. My name is Kelly Wall, and I am the administrative judge of the family section of the Montgomery County Court of Common Pleas. I've sat on the bench since 2010, and prior to that, I practiced family law for about 15 years. Hello, my name is Holly Ford, and I am a Court of Common Pleas judge in Philadelphia County, currently assigned to Family Division, but I've been in Family Division for the last 10 years. I was recently retained. I'm in my 11th year now. Prior to that, I was an attorney. Although I was a generalist, I did a lot of family law for 18 years prior to ascending the bench. My name is Judge John L. Braxton. I am a judge of the Court of Common Pleas. I was elected in the city and county of Philadelphia. I presently am a senior judge sitting in York County, Pennsylvania, where I presently hear family court matters and civil matters. I do kind of play it by ear, but I would say that in the vast majority of cases, I do interview the children. I, I interview the children in almost every custody case. I initially didn't interview children in any custody cases because I thought it put the kids in a difficult spot. I've changed my thinking and I do it in practically every custody case now. My county absolutely does not require that I do anything in particular in a custody case other than try to determine all the facts. However, the rest of the time I think that it's pretty important that at least, if nothing else, they get the opportunity to see what a judge looks like, to see what's going on in court, because otherwise they're precluded from everything. And as I said, they are the center of attraction. So they really are the most important people out of the whole case. And if they're, they don't even have the opportunity to say something, I think it, it does nothing but foster resentment and frustration with a system that by its very nature can be very frustrating and resentful to begin with. When I choose not to interview a child, or when I am not interviewing a child, I make sure the record reflects that neither attorney has asked me to interview a child. So if I was going to provide a tip to, a, to another judge, one of the things that you might not think of is you might want to make sure that on the record or by, or by way of your order, you'll indicate, I always indicate that both parents, neither parent have requested me to interview the child. My decision to interview a child is generally based upon two things. First and foremost, if the litigants choose to have me interview them, I would interview any child under those circumstances. Secondly, Based upon the issues presented, I would make an independent decision as to whether or not I wanted the input of the child. And thirdly, but incorporated into the second response, is the fact that I have to take into consideration the age of any child that is before the court. There's no set set of circumstances I'll use in deciding the interview of the child. Um, it's based upon, a, a comparison would be the criminal law, the totality of the circumstances. It depends on all the factors present in, in the case. You know, five or younger, I usually try to get the parties to agree that I'm not going to get anything out of the child. If they insist, I'll maybe at least try it and see if I can get anything out of the child. Maybe something specific, but certainly not a preference from a child that age. Well, a big advantage is to interview the child at the end of the case because you already know all the information. Uh, one of the things as judges, we tend not to be good actors, and kids are very perceptive about nonverbal cues. So you have to make sure as a judge, if you're conducting the interview late in the case, that you haven't made up your mind. Be uh, kids don't communicate as well verbally, so they'll pick up on the cues oftentimes much better than adults will as to um, what you're thinking. I actually have right in my trial, uh, uh, pre-trial 
um, that if you are going to call the child, you have to let us know ahead of time. Because what I don't want to have happen is somebody brings in the child and then the child sits around the courthouse all day and we don't get to them. So then we decide when, with the attorneys, when I'm going to hear from the child. However, I will tell you that when um, I'm conciliating a case, and let's say we have an older child, um, sometimes I can get the parents to say, look, if I talk to Cindy, uh, alone and she tells me she really really wants to live with mom and I can get that out of her you know sometimes then they won't try the case. Generally I like to hear both parents testify and there's usually one incident that becomes sort of the thread of the whole case and I like to wait till the end because then I like to interview the child to sort of get a determination on who's more credible. I attempt to interview the, child, the children somewhere in the middle of the trial rather than at the beginning of the end. Um, the end sometimes uh, because it may be necessary to hear things. But the beginning, I think if a child is interviewed at the beginning, there are a couple problems. One, they have a tendency to think that they're the head honcho and they've made the decision or that they've had the responsibility of choosing, even though I would never ask a child to choose, uh, a parent. If they're the, the first ones up and you make a decision pretty soon thereafter, they think that they've really had the control. I don't want to give the children the control and I don't want to require the children to have the responsibility of making that decision. The other part of it is, very often I don't know as much about a case as I would know after I hear particularly mom and dad testify. I try to make it as convenient as I can for the kids. Most kids don't start well in the morning, so I like to interview the children at a time when they're going to be alert and awake. If we can keep the kids in school that day uh, by, for example, interviewing them after school, uh, then I'll do that. If we've got a several day custody trial and one of those days I can get them in around lunchtime or something, I'll do that. So it really is to try to make it convenient for the kids. Some interviews are over in as little as 10 or 15 minutes and other views of interviews have lasted well over an hour. It depends on the child, the amount of information that you need to get and how long it takes to get the child relaxed enough to get the information. My interview with the children are almost always short. I would say 10 minutes. Um, I might, if the children are not responding very well, I might limit it to two or three minutes to make sure that there's just not some uh, real alarm that I need to be aware of. Um, and if the children are older and very engaging, it might be 20 minutes or half an hour, but usually it's about 10 minutes of an interview. It's very much up to the child. Sometimes I have to kind of direct it because the children are so loquacious. They just want to talk and talk and talk and I'll have to just kind of let them direct it towards what I need to have, but I let them go at their pace more than anything else let's say nine or under, I try to do them in my chambers. I have a very child-friendly chambers. And, uh, but if the child's older or if we're in, in, a, in a hurry because we want to get it done, I'll do it uh, in the courtroom uh, at the council table and I, I'll take my robe off and sit and talk to the child. I never allow the child to walk through the courtroom with the parents there and the parties there and the custody evaluator off to the side and grandpa and grandma off to the side. The child is, in almost every case, brought around to the back, to the robing room. I think that's important. I, for the most part, interview children in less intensive environments. I try to avoid putting children on witness stands inside of courtrooms. I generally want to meet with them in jury deliberation rooms, ante rooms, and places where a child would feel more comfortable being able to relate to a stranger who has to first of all develop rapport with them and then begin to uh, ask them pertinent questions. And it's important that the attorneys be in a posture where they can, if they see fit to want to participate, can participate without the context of the courtroom and the dramatics that go along with it. That is to say, lawyers generally tend to want to be lawyers in courtrooms where they stand up and have witnesses on the stand. Child witnesses should be treated a little more sensitively. Well, I think the courtroom's scary. To, to do the interviews in the courtroom, I think, is intimidating to the kids. So I try to bring them in. I've got a couple of soft, easy chairs. And if there's two kids, they sit in the easy chairs, and I sit in a hard chair. If there's one kid, then we each sit in the easy chairs. It tries to try to, the goal is to try to make these kids comfortable. They're scared to death. There's certain circumstances where it's, it's helpful to have the children out in the courtroom and, and giving the, the parents their point of view. 
No, I don't wear my robe ever. I always wear my robe. I want the child to know that I am, in fact, the judge. So that's sort of the indicia of my judgehood. And so I keep it on so that there's never any confusion that I'm not your best friend, I'm not the nice church lady, I'm not your school teacher, I'm the judge. I never wear my robe during the interview. Again, sometimes I'll put it on to show the kids that I'm really a judge and, and joke around with them. I'm talking about kids that are 10 or 12 or older. Um, but no, I don't wear it. I think it's just a little more intimidating. I try to take my jacket off and be in just shirt sleeves as well. I interview the children with my robe on um, for t two reasons. One, one of my questions for the truth and a lie is, if I told you that my robe was black, would that be a truth or a lie? So it's very easy because also anybody reading the transcript would be able to understand that. Um, but otherwise, I also, uh, I think it's important for them to understand that I have the authority to make the decision and that it remains with me. I never interview them together. I always interview them separately uh, for the same reason why you don't have the parents sitting there uh, because um, you, want, some, you want, want the children to be honest and not feel any pressure and not speak to the issues that they feel they need to speak to because another, another child is there. I always interview the children separately unless there's a problem with a sibling who, where if a child is very afraid. Up until recently, I've always interviewed children together with the theory that uh, they'd be more comfortable and they can rely on each other and have the support of each other during the questioning. Since then, I've come to realize that I'm really only getting the opinion of the strongest child and that the children might have different opinions, so I've changed. So I'd have to say my current thinking is that I interview the children separately and for a good reason. I think the law is clear that if the if the parties are represented and the attorneys insist on being in the room, they have to be in the room. Uh, my job is to make them not want to be there. And so I have worked on that usually at the pretrial conference. Um, and it's rare that a child opens up better more people that are in the room, more strangers that are in the room. Um, and I think people get that. On the other hand, I want to make sure that the lawyers know that they have the opportunity to give me any list of questions that they think it's important for me to ask. Well, I don't try to negotiate with lawyers to not be present because they have a right to be present. On the other hand, I don't make them the conspicuous leader during the interview. I am in close proximity to the child, and the lawyers are in more distant positions so that the child can speak freely and know that they're talking to the judge and not to mommy's lawyer or daddy's lawyer. I would prefer that attorneys not come in to the interview. However, the rules require that if they want to come in, I have to allow them. I'm pretty fortunate that most of the attorneys in Montgomery County know me well enough to know that I do, I think, a very good job of interviewing the children and I prefer to not have them in there. And I'll tell you, my experience has been that children are much more comfortable if the attorneys are not in the, in the office with us. They're more honest with me. They're more comfortable with me. So generally speaking, they're not. If they insist, I have to allow them in. And what I'll do is I'll seat them in the very back. And the child will look at me. And luckily, in that situation, the children forget that the, uh, the attorneys are back there but they're all the way back and they're not allowed to speak. In a situation where there, is, there are either two pro se's or there's a pro se and an attorney on the other side, I will not allow them to come in. I do not want a child to have to sit there in front of his or her parent and tell me awful things. I want them to feel comfortable to be able to tell me things, especially if there is a, an allegation of abuse. Uh, pro se parents or pro se parties are very difficult, uh, especially when there's one lawyer and, and the other side doesn't have a lawyer. But when I have an interview with the children, I let none of the parents in there. These children are not going to give me reliable information if their parents are in the room. So uh, if I've got two pro se's, I announce that I'm going to interview the children and they're just going to have to wait in the courtroom until I'm done. If I've got one pro se and one lawyer, then I announce that the lawyer and the parent will not be allowed in the interview. Uh, it's on the record 
but that they won't be allowed to be there because I'm afraid the presence of a parent at all is just too intimidating. As far as I'm concerned, the attorneys have a right to waive or not waive. The individuals, the parties, uh, I don't believe that they have a right to say, yes, I want to sit in. Um, so if the attorney doesn't waive, then the other party would have a right to sit in. Obviously, the pro se litigant would. And once I explain that to the attorney, that either mom or dad, whoever the other side is, or third party, grandma, grandpa, we have lots of third party uh, people in custody, uh, they would they generally back off right away because the last thing in the world they want is the chilling effect of a parent or a parental figure in the room during an interview. I don't do any particular uh, voir dire of the children to determine their competency. I think I, I ask some general questions up front. If I see that they're wearing a NASCAR hat, I ask them who their favorite driver is, or if they're wearing a Phillies hat, I ask them who their favorite player is. And if I'm getting good, positive information and the children are, are telling me uh, factual material, then I think that's a, a screening t tool, but it's not a voir dire in particular. Well, the decision on how to qualify a child is going to depend on the age. With the younger children, what I'll do is I'll, and these are only a few of my toys, I'll say to them, well, which one do you like? And they'll pick out a toy and they'll say, I like SpongeBob. So what I'll say is, well, can you tell me if I told you that SpongeBob was orange, would I be telling you the truth or would I be lying? So I'll actually do the wild air of the child based on the toy. And that helps them because they have comfort and then they'll, they'll get to hold the, the child through uh, the toy through the interview. Or if the child's older, I'll just say to them, look, you know, you've probably have done this before and I, I'm going to ask you, do you know the difference between telling the truth and telling a lie? And the older ones kind of laugh like I'm asking them a silly question. I take the approach that I want to create rapport with the young person first. So I'm not going to say to them necessarily the incidences of what you do to difference between telling the truth and telling a lie. But during the course of my discussions with them, I will ask them the critical questions. Do they know the difference between telling the truth and telling a story? Oh, yes, Judge, I do know the difference. Well, when we were talking today and you were answering my questions, were you telling me the truth or were you telling me stories? That's the kind of approach I take. I prefer not to have the attorneys ask the children questions because I think it's already it's already scary enough that they're sitting in a judge's chamber and to have two people asking them questions, especially if you have a person who's a little bit more uh, aggressive than should be. So generally speaking, I do not allow the attorneys to ask questions. I will ask them to submit to me a list of questions that they would like to ask. And then after the interview, what I'll do is I'll step back and I'll say to them, is there anything that I've missed? but most of the questions come directly from me. I think that the questioning should be done by me as the judge because uh, the lawyers might get involved in, in becoming advocates and trying to uh, persuade the child in one way or another to give favorable information and I think that children should not be part of the tug of war of the litigation. Even though their voice is important and their uh, opinions are important, I don't want them in the middle of it. Uh, there are some very aggressive attorneys and I may keep them from asking their aggressive questions. Uh, we may go off the record and I may say pass up what questions you want uh, and I'll see if it's appropriate. But if they are good family law practitioners who are calm and are respectful of the fact that we're dealing with a, a child, um, I'll let them ask some questions. In the situation where there may be aggressive attorneys, what I will do is, number one, I'll admonish the attorney to tone down and try to ask the questions in a bit friendlier manner, or I will terminate the interview. If an attorney is aggressive, absolutely. I mean, I had an attorney um, that wanted me to ask the question. The issue was uh, about whether or not there was drinking, and the uh, attorney wanted me to ask uh, the nine-year-old if um, she ever saw Daddy with fruit in his drinks and things like that, and I just, I said, we're not. Not, I'm not turning kids into tattletales. So, but I did ask her to submit the questions so that they're in the record. And if there's, you know, if there's appeal and she wants to um, claim that I didn't ask the question she wants, they're there. But uh, no, I wouldn't let that happen. There's an old saying that an attorney is only as strong as a judge is weak. 
So, uh, especially in child custody cases, you, you need to keep the attorneys under control. Uh, if you anticipate having a problem or if you're working with an attorney that you've never worked with before, call the attorneys in the chambers <coughs> and, and have um, a conversation with them about what your expectations are. Out. I always tell them that um, we can't keep secrets. Now, when I when no one's there, I say, now if you tell me not to tell them what they're said, what you, you said, I won't. But sometimes they know what you said by what I do. Well, I tell them that I will protect that and that I will not disclose it. But I also tell them that I can't use that information because I can't cite uh, the information. If they tell me that Daddy is mean to pets. Uh, or something like that, then I can't very well use that as part of my reasoning. So I tell them that they can tell me, and it's, it'll be a secret, but I won't be able to use that as part of my decision making. I explain to the child that I have a court reporter who's taking down the conversation and that parents will never see that transcript. I explain that the transcript may be read by the superior case, a court in the case of an appeal. However, uh, I explain to the child that if they report certain things to me that I have a responsibility to make sure that they get help. Like if a child is going to address a concern about an abuse issue, I obviously have to make sure that I get help and I have to get the information to an authority. If it's just a circumstance where, for example, I have a child who comes in and says, my stepfather makes me uncomfortable, it's not really an abuse. But it's a situation where the parent doesn't want to, I'm sorry, the child doesn't want to hurt the parent. So I have to find ways of sort of addressing the child's concern with the parent without giving away the little secret that they told me. So the level of secrecy is going to depend on how serious the allegation is. Um, judges are permitted in Pennsylvania to seal the testimony of, of the children. Um, so if there's an agreement between counsel uh, that's placed on the record, uh, it can actually be sealed. I've had cases that have gone up on appeal and have been upheld with a record of the testimony sealed. It was not released to um, either of the attorneys. It was only released to the Superior Court for appellant purposes. From a practical point of view, though, you can't necessarily trust the attorneys who are before you. Um, you can develop a rapport over a period of years with attorneys who regularly practice before you and you know who's going to listen to the instructions not to repeat this um, to the client, but that's not necessarily true. So you have to have a, a good conversation with the child uh, about what's taking place and what's going on and what the potential consequences are. I tell the children that their parents absolutely cannot hear and I seal the records, which I, a lot of people don't do. I try to be actually proactive about that. Before the child's even had a chance to ask me to keep a secret, I tell them, well, first of all, they know that there's a court reporter, and I've explained you, what the court reporter does, so they know that what we're saying is being taken down. But I, if I was asked directly about secrets, I would tell them that I cannot keep secrets. Um, but again, if they don't want to answer a question, they can say so, and I won't ask it again. Um, if there's something that's very important that they want to tell me, but they're afraid to tell their parents, and they tell me that they're afraid to tell their parents, I let them know that I can't promise that it will be kept secret, but I can promise you that they won't hear it from me. I, I want to see what the psychological evaluator says. I want to see what the parents say. So maybe I know that Cindy Lou is a uh, softball player or, you know, Billy uh, likes to play hockey. Um, so I usually talk about that sort of thing with them ahead of time. Um, something I've learned maybe that they, where they go on vacation, um, I try to, I tell them I have kids and see if I could do something like that. Uh, I did have a case the one time um, where the, child was it was very difficult to speak to him he would clam up all the time but he loved video games and I, I I can't remember what the issue was but I had to get some information out of him um, and luckily we had a little time between uh, the last day of the trial and when I had to interview the child so we set up a we 
Uh, I brought in my son's we, and he and I sat there with the court reporter who wasn't taking down the unnecessary, and I, he and I played we. Luckily, he was young, and I could actually play the game, and I'm not very good at the older ones. But um, So we played, and he, he just blabbed to me everything I needed to hear. Again, one of the things, I don't want to take notes because I think that will hinder the rapport building. I'm trying to get these kids to have a conversation with me like we're just sitting around. However, what I found originally is then I'd go on to another part of the trial and I'd be sitting there thinking, what did that kid say? I don't have any notes for it. So um, I have my tip staff come in. Um, I know other judges have used their law clerk. Um, my tip staff um, is a child at heart and sometimes jokes with the kids, but she sits there and takes the notes for me of what, about what the child says. So I don't have to interrupt the conversation or make that kid feel like what they just said is really important to me right now and writing it down. I want it to be a conversation. But again, you need to have somebody writing down what's being said. So. I don't use much in the way of props. I don't, I never have candy because you never know what kind of food issues children have and whether or not their mother or father would allow them to eat that. So I'm not going there. Um, I do before we even really get going. And sometimes it's even before we're on the record, although I, it, it can't be on the record because it involves the court reporter. I introduce the children, each child, to the court reporter and have the court reporter show the child how she does or he does their job. I try always to start off with, in my questions, things that have nothing to do with the custodial situation. I want to know about their friends, although it do that does ultimately have something to do. But I want to know about their pets. I want to know about their favorite sports. I want to know about um, if they're active in church. I want to know like what kinds of things they do. I ask all kinds of seemingly innocuous questions that just help establish, I hope, a rapport. And I, I feel free to give them pieces of me in that process. Um, I follow uh, what there's some literature called cognitive dissidence um, for people who are familiar with um, uh, probation interviewing for children. It's called motivational interviewing. Uh, if you speak to somebody and get them to relax and, and over a period of time uh, develop a good rapport with them and over a period of time over an initial interview of maybe 5, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, talk about um, what sports they're interested in. Talk about how they're doing in school. Uh, talk about anything you can to get the child to relax. Look at the, the verbal and the nonverbal cues that they're giving. And when they're relaxed, uh, then you can start asking the more difficult questions. Then, uh, you know, you have to uh, pay attention as you're asking the more difficult questions. If they start to become uncomfortable, then you can slip back into the the more conversational uh, issues that you were having before to get them to relax again. When children are reluctant to talk, I will go to as many measures as possible um, to get them to talk. Um, if there's something I can relate to, I will. If the children feel more comfortable, some of the little ones in particular are used to circle time at either daycare or kindergarten. And so I ask them if they're more comfortable doing circle time, I sit on the floor with them in circle time. If they are crawling someplace, uh, one of the attorneys reminded me that I had retrieved a child from under a desk because uh, she was Spanish speaking and I spoke Spanish to um, her, but also got down on my hands and knees and talked to her at her level. And I think that's really important. If I speak to a child even on the street, I will tend to drop down so that you're at their level and you're not always this, you know, you're talking to my thigh or hip or whatever. When a child comes into my office, my first job is to make them feel comfortable. What I do is I will get up. I will go over to the door, shake the child's hand, and walk the child over to my conference table. I will then show them all the toys, and I'll say, do you like SpongeBob? And I'll say, look, we have some candy for you. I want to make you comfortable. I think they look at me and they think, oh my God, she's like a nice lady. And then through the, the interview, I try to find something that I have in common with them. I have a son. so. I either look for a sports, I ask them where they go to school, I ask them uh, you know, who their best friend is, what's their favorite character. 
with girls, I uh, usually they like the fact I always wear a lot of jewelry and things. I, I love accessories, and the girls love it. So they look at me, and I can tell they're checking out everything. So I think they, they feel comfortable with me when they meet me and see that like, I'm not a big, bad, mean judge. You, you obtain much more information by open-ended questions. And again, you use the pause, and you look at them while they're talking, and, and generally they'll fill in the pause and try to give you more information. And then you pick up on the conversation of what they had, and you lead into the ne next question uh, with that information. I think the process has to be different with the uh, children, depending on their age, because I think you have to lead uh, children who are young a little more. You have to ask them more yes and no questions. You have to give them an easier uh, way out than asking them to give you a narrative answer. Older kids are going to be prepared, and they usually have something they want to tell you, uh, and they're going to try to figure out a way to say that two or three times if they can. Tell me about how your living is right now. Tell me about the time you spend with mom and the time you spend with dad and what's your favorite part and what's your not favorite part about it. And is there any part of that you, that you would want to change? Is there any part of that that you hope never gets changed? Um, and things of that nature. Um, so if I, if I feel like the children have uh, come with a particular parent, have spent, you know, very often what happens, you have, they're coming off of like a week with another parent, uh, um, which they kind of negotiate to do that, uh, or they talk to the, the attorneys. I'll ask them that. I'll ask them if anybody has told you to say anything today, and uh, what did the attorney tell you, because obviously that's not privilege. But if I've the, I'll usually have a heads up ahead of time. Looks, you know, Susie's been with Dad at Disney World for a week before we came here. So I might ask some questions about that uh, too. Uh, but it, it, it gives me a frame of reference, especially if a child's going to tell me that they love being with Dad because he's fun all the time. Um, I also had a teenager who was really mouthy and incredibly rude and started off her session with me, not even introducing herself, saying, and so I took a little time to try and get her to calm down and back off and just talk to me a little bit person to person and give me some background and explain to me why. And the bottom line was she had a script and she wasn't going to get off script. She couldn't dare get off script. And I knew at that moment that there was no point in trying to dig any deeper, that I had heard everything that she intended to say and said, thanks, I think we're done. Well, one way uh, that I start interviews, and probably my most common way, is I have a, a, a long conversation to develop a good rapport with the child to get the child to relax. And then a question I say, if I told you that you love your mother very much and you like to spend time with her, would that be a correct question or a correct? And they'll say yes uh, or, or no. Um, and then I'll say, if I told you that you love your father very much and you like to spend time with him, would that be correct? Now, the important thing is the follow-up is the why. And what I've generally found over doing that question for 22 years and hundreds of cases is overwhelmingly the children are going to say, I, I love my father or I love my mother um, and I like to spend time with them unless there's a particular problem. Um, and if there's a particular problem then they'll usually volunteer the information at the time. I've also found that the children whose relationship has been undermined by the other parent is going to respond, I don't love my father or I don't love my mother. Um, I've had children who have suffered a fair amount of physical abuse uh, but their relationship had not been undermined, but had been supported initially by the other parent. And the response was, I love my father, but could you get him to quit hitting me? When I conduct my interviews, I like to try to found, find out who the child spoke to and whether the child was prepared by somebody. So often what I'll do is I will start out my interview after the, uh, you know, the ha who, what's your name and, and getting them comfortable. I'll say to them in a very innocent way, well, you know, sometimes moms and dads want, want you to tell me something, and why don't we get that out of the way first? So that way, some t children blurt out and say, well, mom told me to tell you I want to live with her. So that tells me right away that the child's been prepped. I've had children that have 
have admitted to me that daddy's attorney said that I should say this or that. So I try to indirectly find out who the child has spoken to before coming in to see me so that I can make a determination as to whether I need to call in the attorneys and admonish them. Uh, if I find a child's been prepped, that, whole, that factor slides down low because I, can't real, I have really not gotten a good bead on what the child really wants because of the prep work that went in behind that. I'll never ask a child which parent they want to be with. I am mindful that if a child bears his or her soul to me and tells me their deepest thoughts and fears and so on, and may express a really profound preference that I don't ultimately go with, it's important to me not to feel as though I've been um, that I have not betrayed that child. But I never, ever would ask for a choice or in any way denigrate one parent or the other to the child. Uh, there are certain things that I will not ask, point blank, and that is, who do you want to live with? It's not a question that I ever ask. My interviews are geared toward trying to get a feel for what the child's opinion is. Some children will blurt it out but I don't want to put anybody on the spot and certainly there's some children who are just so frightened and they're just they feel sick about having to pick a parent I don't ever want to put them in that position I never ask the question directly I feel as though I don't need to because if I'm doing my job right I'm eliciting that information in all of those other subtle ways and to, to ask the child that directly makes them feel as though it's their decision. It makes it feel as though their preference is all that counts. So I don't go there. I, I rarely go there. When soliciting a child's preference, you don't want to ask a child directly his preference. You don't want to cross-examine a child. You don't want to criticize a child. But undoubtedly, you need to target in on a preference and from time to time I'll ask them directly. But I tried to warm up to it as opposed to asking them at the beginning. I, I used it just a couple of weeks ago and I used the magic wand. Can I you describe that? Well the magic wand is if you could in fact make anything come into existence or go out of existence with the magic wand. And I may, you ask about props, I may hand the child my pen and say, okay, you got the magic wand now. Tell me what you want to happen. Well, I have never had a child say, I want you to go away. <laughs> so I think that it's working. Because if they said they want me to go away, then I recognize that it's a different situation altogether. What they are looking at is the things that are negative in their life that they would like to change, but don't feel they have the power or capacity to change. I now have given them a magic wand. And everyone knows some imaginary story about the magic wand. With my interviews, I really don't want to get to the bottom line and ask who do you want to live with. I would say if you had three wishes, what would they be? And often in that last segment, I'll get information I haven't asked about. The child will tell me where he or she wants to go. And the child will also actually rat parents out, <laughs> tell me, well, mom said I should say this, or dad said that, make sure that you tell the judge this or that. So that's my, my little opportunity to try to get some additional information. I, I really try not to ask direct questions because a lot of children are very compliant and they'll try and figure out what answer you want. And I would rather get an evasive answer to an indirect question than a direct answer to a direct question that I'm not sure is true. I, I, it really is dependent upon the child. Now I'm talking mostly younger children. When you get to the older ones, I can be tougher with questions. And if there is a, I think the worst question that I ever ask is, 
um, if a child is absolutely refuses to is recalcitrant about seeing the, the parent no matter what um, and they say I, I don't want to see dad I, I hate him I don't want to be a part of him um, sometimes I say I'm going to ask you a really really tough question if something happened to your dad tomorrow if you he were hit by a bus or something awful happened to him and you never had a chance to talk to him about how you felt or how angry you were would you want that to happen or would you want me to give you the chance to ask those questions I said I understand that you may be angry I understand that you know if dad hasn't seen you for six months and you were expecting him every Friday um, that that may be painful or hurtful but you have a right to address those issues I have only once where a child just couldn't stop crying. And it was so clear that this child was suffering that I, 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 there was no way I was going to compound it by trying and trying harder. There was nothing I was going to say that was going to make this child feel any better. There was no useful information I was going to get other than the fact that this child was so distressed that it's something I needed to take serious look at. Um, I've had a couple cases where the child just got so upset and uh, I just, I wasn't getting anything else out of uh, her, um, that situation. I've also, also stopped it when we're, we're going nowhere, we're, we're, where that rapport building, you know, comes into, we're talking about whether or not we like to go to Dave and Buster's or something like that. I'm really not getting anything that helps the case. Um, they're just not going to tell me. But again, that's on a case by case basis and I'll, I'll talk to them for as long as I have to talk to them to see if they'll just start to open up. There are circumstances where I have stopped an interview. For example, a child who's too young and is so frightened they won't speak and they're clearly uncomfortable. I've had situations where children are so angry they just shut down, they don't want to be there, and I can, do ev I can try all the candy and toys I want and they just don't want to be there. After the interview, I always go in the courtroom uh, and if, if there have been lawyers, now the lawyers are in the courtroom with me as well, but if there haven't been lawyers, the, the parents are, are going to hear this for the first time. And I do explain that I found their children to be candid or they seem to be a little bit intimidated. I learned, learned about Fluffy the dog and I, you know, and so I give them some tidbits of what I've learned and I also tell them that there is a transcript and if they wish to read that transcript at some point in the, in the future, they can request a copy of it and we'll have it transcribed. If it's some issue that I think the parties need to know about, um, uh, that, they, that they can't wait until they can look in the transcript, so to speak. I mean, I had one uh, very recently where the child, uh, dad thought she had a weight problem, mom didn't think she had a weight problem, and the one of the first things the child said to me is leaned across the table and said, you know, I have a weight problem. So I shared that with the parents uh, because by the time they get my, my uh, decision, um, I want them to know that it was problematic for the child. Other than that, then I figured they can just look it up later. The first thing I do is, on the record of course, I tell the parents that I've, I've had the pleasure of meeting their son or daughter. They should both be very proud of their son and daughter. I tell them that it's obvious their son and daughter is very sensitive, very bright, very smart, and that your son and daughter loves them both very, very much. I'll also advise them not to cross-examine their child after, you know, after the, after the court proceeding and not to, you know, unilaterally pepper them with questions. Okay. No, I don't go back and tell them that they told me A, B, or C exactly about them, but I certainly let them know that their children are observing them because it's what they do, they've done clearly and conspicuously in front of their children but the children have related that to me as something that has offended them. What I do say is said with an intent to be constructive, not destructive of the parties, nor of the parties' relationship. I don't want children punished because they talk to me, the judge. Generally what I'll do is after the child interview, I will bring the attorneys in and I will give them a brief summary of what happened. Now, often I'll say to them, look, you need to go out and speak to your, your clients, let them know what the children have said, and sometimes that'll help settle the case. And then I'll try to paraphrase what the child has said to me without divulging any, I'm not going to say secrets, but some concerns that the children may have that may sound a little harsh to a parent.
I like to go in and talk to the parents and say, yeah. he told me that he has one wish, and his one wish about custody is that he not feel caught in the middle between the arguments of the two of you. And here's where you, you can do that. You can go to you know, counseling and uh, work out some conflict resolution in counseling. Uh, you can quit delivering messages through the kid when you exchange. Tell your mother this, tell your dad that. You ought to be talking to each other about those issues, not in the presence of the child. You, know, you need to do these things because the worst thing in your kid's life is he feels caught in the middle between the two of you. The most difficult cases we have is when you have an adolescent, when you have a 14, 15, 16, 17 year old, when you have an older child that really is very, very independent and is very traumatically affected by what has been going on, has strong opinions, there's nothing the judge is going to do that's going to change that child. I'm only interviewing that child for 10 minutes, for 20 minutes, and never again will I meet with that child. So I have no influence over that child. But meeting that child will help me put a protocol together, a protocol together that I believe the child will follow. I, I think the most practical tip I have for child interviews is you, you have to be sincerely invested in family court. Um, Former Chief Justice Ralph Cappy, a number of years ago, had a call for judges to remain in family court for a longer period of time. Um, I've been in family court for 22 years. I'm the president judge. I could assign myself to, to any division at this point. I've chosen to remain in family court because I think it's so important. You have to realize that in family court, you're deciding what's going to happen in the future for this child. In criminal court and civil court, you're deciding what happened in the past and what the consequences will be for those actions. I think it's helpful if you can remember that these kids, even the ones who say they really have something to say and they have to tell it to the judge, they don't want to be caught up in this process. So the more you can downplay their the more you can downplay how much what they say matters, the better. So you're not minimizing what they have to say, but you're letting them know that they are a part of what you're considering, but not all. And I think that that takes a huge burden away from children because sometimes they feel as though it's all on their shoulders. And I try and lift that and put it back on my shoulders where it belongs, hoping that it will help the child. Well, the results of a child interview with regard to especially the 16 factors I'm, I am required now to balance, I would say that that may depend on the age of the child and the circumstances. With regard to young children, it's it's a factor that I have pretty low on my, my scale because I think young children they can't really give you your opinion. They're not really sure what they want to do. The older the child gets, the more that I will give the age and the interview uh, consideration. You have to also be careful, though, because what happens is the older children come in prepared. They know what they want. They're ready to battle. And in some cases, it's not in their best interest to be with the parent that they want to be with. I think the child interview process is, is a very important one. I, I started off my practice not interviewing the children because I thought it put the children in the middle and I thought it was too difficult and I wanted the children as isolated and removed from the process as I could. Um, I've changed that over the last four or five years and I now interview the children every chance I can because I think their voice is important and I think it empowers them rather than tortures them. So I think it's important and I think it's uh, valuable. I think the uh, the benefit of a child interview is that um, you're not leaving a stone unturned. Uh, the parents can really focus on the conflict between each other and not get down to the best interests of the child sometimes. So this is a good way to do that. And it's also very often a, a valuable tool for resolving the issue. Once the parents hear from an impartial third party what their children have said, that can be very persuasive in getting them to move off of their dead center and go toward a compromised position.
I think that I would tell a new judge that it is amazing how much the children will give you if you make them feel comfortable and that you can really find out a whole lot more about a case when the children are involved and how very important it is for children to be interviewed and to feel like they're a part of it all. Uh, that's probably the number one thing. Um, well, I, I do think that sometimes when you're in a hurry, you tend to skip that rapport building portion of, or at least cut it short. And that's always disastrous um, because they're clam up, they're, you know, they're, you get kids that are one of two ways. They're either clutching the side of the chair and they're terrified and then they're not going to get out of them. Or they've been coached and they're just going to blather on. So somehow you have to get that rapport ahead of time. We're talking about the family. Each of us has it. question is what role we play in their lives. Both parents should have the right to play their role. And that's what I am trying to make sure that I say because that's what I feel and that's what I know the law to be. But just because they don't cohabitate doesn't mean that they're not a family. We have to work in a timely fashion in this area of the law because we cannot allow time for the most part to resolve the issues for us. So the judge has to keep maintaining an environment where issues can be resolved because the parties themselves are oftentimes not able to resolve them. And with that in mind, I recognize that we want to be available to bring things to a conclusion for people because closure is important in life. And I think we have an opportunity to give that to people. It may not be the perfect answer, but we give them answers. For the children of parents that are experiencing divorce or separation, the day that they must enter a courtroom, walk past both parents, and speak to a judge about some of the most personal aspects of their life is a day that they will always remember. We are hopeful that this program will be used as an essential educational tool for parents, attorneys, and judges as they guide children through this process.